Happy Wednesday, everyone. Good afternoon or wherever you are in your own time zone. Thank you for joining us for Mind Matters. I'm so happy. I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, the first of three conversations that I'll be having over the coming weeks with uh, different leaders in the mental health uh, space with KMH, uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. You know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shown a spotlight on the importance of mental health. And as we weather the storm together as a nation, as people, it's it's clear that mental health um, really has never been more important in so many ways and it unites us. And that's, um, you know, a subject that we need to talk more and more about. So um, KMH is Canada's largest mental health a teaching and research hospital. They serve more than 37,000 Canadians every year, you know, patients that, that um, that uh, receive uh, help from the center. And it combines clinical expertise, research, education, uh, system leadership to drive real social, social change and improve treatment and support. And they also accelerate the discovery and uh, to, to really train the next generation of mental health care providers. Now, talking about mental health, uh, despite it impacting everyone directly or indirectly. So individuals themselves who suffer or their families or their friends, it can be really difficult. And by coming together, by telling our stories, by really holding on tight, um, you know, as a community and hearing the diverse stories of Canadians, 
we can find hope and we can find strength and we can find inspiration and we can find recovery. It is possible to recover from a mental health issue. So joining me today, I can't wait to meet this courageous and inspiring woman. Dr. Juveria Zahir is a psychiatrist and medical education lead at KMH's um, emergency department. She's also a clinician scientist uh, at the Institute for Mental Health Policy Research. And Dr. Zahir is a leading expert and regularly provides advice to Canadians about how to support others and their own mental health. So hello, hello, Dr. Zahir. I'm so glad that you are joining us. It's so nice to be with you today. Please call me Javeria. All right, and please call me Sophie. <laughs> Perfect. So, Javeria, um, first question. You, you know, if youngers are looking up to you, and I'm sure a lot of them are right now in, in, in Canada or across the world, um, did you always know that this was your destiny? You know, I remember being a young girl growing up in Newfoundland, and um, there's a very small and close-knit Muslim community. And in lots of ethnic communities, people say, you know, it's really important to pursue education and, and being a physician, you can help people. And I remember saying I wanted to be a doctor, being told that was the right thing to do and saying, well, what about psychiatry? And I remember people saying, do whatever you want, don't do psychiatry because our people don't have those problems and that's for crazy people. And I, But I remember thinking, you know, mental health is important even at a young age and lots of us are affected. And so it's been a really interesting journey to sort of move away from mental health as a little girl and then come all the way back. I think what drew me to psychiatry is I love hearing people's stories. It is a great gift to sit with someone and to understand their pain and their joy and their resilience and their recovery and figure out how we can say to them, you know, you're suffering and it's okay and we're going to get through this together. It's so incredible to, to hear a scientist, a researcher, a medical expert also show so much warmth and empathy and compassion. Sometimes the, the uh, you know, scientific community seems away or, or far, far reached from us. You're, you're right here right now, and this is what you do every day. So my heart goes to you and my mind as well, obviously, uh, to thank you for, for how devoted you are. And you say that, you know, as a little girl, you already had this dream of becoming a doctor. But you just said right now, people's reaction, and that's that's what I'm. I'm not going to guess your age, but how? <laughs> how? Yeah, how, like thirty years ago, you know, okay, thirty so now. Years ago, thirty years ago, people were saying we don't have those crazy people in Canada. So I suffered from a mental health issue mm -hmm. in my teenage years. I'm not crazy. Other people who suffer from other mental health, mental health issues are not crazy either. Has this changed? Do you think people see mental health differently today in 2021? You know, I absolutely do. I think we have come so far societally, whether it's businesses putting their names on buildings, whether it's a person saying to their friend, you know, I've been through this. I've had really dark times, whether it's writing or blogging or having even in, having events like this. I think we have come so far in talking about mental health and mental illness. And, you know, it's interesting as a suicide prevention researcher, as an emergency department psychiatrist, I will say in the last year of the pandemic, more people have come to me with questions about mental health. More people who I love and care about have said, you know, I'm suffering. Are there resources available for me? And um, I think it's really extraordinary. And I think it's just the first step. And I think, as you said, now more than ever, we understand that mental health is health and we have this shared trauma that we're all experiencing. And it's really important that we address it in care. You just said two words together, shared trauma. I, I share um, some words that resonate within me and usually the response is positive, but I want you to tell me what you think about it. We're all one trauma away from one another. What does this mean to you from a health, mental health perspective? Because it could happen to anybody. I think this is such a, a beautiful statement. And to me, trauma is an experience that is really hard to let go of, that affects your life. And I think right now we see that we all have this trauma. We're all experiencing difficulty concentrating. We have ideas and thoughts that get stuck in our head that we can't get rid of. Sometimes it's really hard to sleep. And I wonder that as we share this experience together, that we're only one trauma away from each other, even though, you know, I am extraordinarily privileged and have, you know, a secure profession and people I can lean on. At the same time, you know, all of us are in this together. And if we can understand and be empathic and say, this really affected me, you know, it helps us invest in people and invest in society, invest in people who are struggling. So mental health does not discriminate. It can happen to Anyone, no matter where you're from, how much money you have or don't have, what you do, it doesn't matter. Mental health does not discriminate. Um, 
I'm really into uh, brain health. I want to know right now as a scientist, what are we discovering so that every Canadian can actually understand their brain better and how we work? Yeah, this is a great question. And one of the reasons I love working at CAMH is, you know, I'm a suicide prevention researcher and some of the work that I do is understanding epidemiology. So understanding which groups of people are more or less affected, how they get care and understanding people's stories. So I do a lot of interviews with people very much like this and understand how they negotiated getting healthcare and treatment. But in something as big as suicide prevention or mental health care, we need to take a broader look. And so there are researchers at CAMH, for example, that can understand biomarkers and proteins that can become medication treatment targets. We can understand how, if you have trauma, how your brain can react in different ways and light up in different ways. And that can help us, I think, normalize mental illness and say that this is not because you're weak. This isn't because you're cowardly. This is because you're suffering. And we need to come up with biological treatments and we need to come up with psychological treatments, but we also need to address the social factors like housing insecurity and food insecurity. And I think that's what's so beautiful about mental health care is it takes all of us. It takes every scientist. It takes every person. It takes every advocate. Um, my next question concerning this is, so now that we know that the brain is plastic, is flexible, uh, that we can rewire our brain in every action that we undertake every single day, which means we can break bad habits and create better habits. What's a useful you know, help tool that you can give Canadians to break bad habits when right now, you know, the addiction and the substances during COVID and pandemic there's, there's more use. So how do we navigate this? How can we help ourselves? Mm -hmm. And I'm reflecting on, as you, as you were speaking, I remember reading a study that said that alcohol consumption in Canada went up by a third yeah. in the first month of the pandemic. And I think part of this is the things that we used to do to keep ourselves safe and well, traveling, seeing friends, exercising outside, it gets, sort of gets taken away from you. And I think so then we kind of rely on these these things that may be maladaptive. I think the first step is to, to treat yourself with empathy, to say that, you know, lots of people are struggling and I'm struggling too. And empathy isn't a pie. You can't just give it all away. The more you give, the more you get, I think. So I think the first step is to say, I'm deserving of hope and I'm deserving of help. And there are a lot of really effective treatments that can help kind of break the patterns of, of how we think or can kind of rewire them, as you say. We can sort of do things like cognitive behavioral therapy that can help us understand our ways of thinking and, and challenge them and adapt them. There's dialectical behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy. All of these things are ways of saying, I see you, you're suffering, and there's another way out there and we can help you figure that out. So, so humor is an important part in my life and it was an important part of my recovery when I when I suffered from eating disorders and self-esteem issues. Uh, and, you know, I kind of laughed it off at first when, you know, essential services that remained open, part of it was alcohol, you know, stores. And it does say something about the culture of relaxing through substances. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a meditation and, and meditation practitioner and, and, uh, and teacher. And I discovered something through meditation and yoga that calm my mind in ways that nothing else could could do and from a health perspective what do you think about you know all the recent studies that have shown that meditation does affect uh, brain brain waves brain patterns uh, sleep waves and all that how can people because it's easy and people think they have to be good at it so can we demystify the mm -hmm. you know the meditation aspect here with, where it should be more accessible to so many people? Absolutely. And I'm thinking about people I see in the emergency department, and it feels like you're chasing, chasing, chasing and running. You're doing school, you're doing work, you're trying to take care of your kids, you're, you're doing all of these things. And I think it can be very difficult to be in the moment. And I think one of the things about meditation and mindfulness that is really extraordinary is it is a skill. And I remember even saying to saying to a friend in the last few months, I'm terrible. I can't, I, I'm not a mindful person. I can't meditate. But then it's a skill. It's something that you can learn to do. And that well, we you can don't all have learn to be good how to at do. it. People yeah. don't have to be good at meditation. Get that out of your mind, funny. Get it out of your mind. <laughs> um, but meditation and just sitting in silence or just paying attention to your breath, if you can pay attention to to your screen, you know. 10 hours a day or one hour or whatever, we can take five minutes to actually sit down and see what's happening with our body, with our breath and with our mind. Because sometimes our minds play tricks on us. And you know, the little gerbil is running and running and running and it's like, how do I stop this? How do I stop this? 
You wear many hats. You're a busy lady. You're a mother. You're a teacher. You're a scientist. You're a researcher. How do you create more peace within yourself, more compassion? What do you do? Yeah, I, uh, it's a great question. And I think it's a question we need to ask ourselves more often. And the thing about wearing many hats is sometimes the struggle in a day is like finding the right hat or knowing what order to put them on in. Um, I think for me, one of the things that has been really interesting for me during the pandemic is to actually take a breath and to to stop for a second and to say, what are my priorities? What are my family's priorities? What is negotiable and what is non-negotiable? And if you were lifting weights, for example, and all of a sudden someone puts a 50 pound weight on your back, you're not going to lift the same amount of weight you were lifting earlier. And so I think that kind of focus on, on progress rather than perfection um, has been very helpful um, for us. And I think I see a lot through my daughter's eyes. Uh, I have a seven and a half year old. She's very clear on the half. She said, don't say seven, say oh. seven and a half. All my and kids are the same. <laughs> She's like waiting for seven and three quarters soon. Aww. And I have a three-year-old as well. And, um, you know, through their eyes, they say, you know, mama is a doctor for feelings. Um, and so it allows us to have these conversations early about, you know, sometimes you might feel really sad. Sometimes you might feel really worried and that's normal. That's okay. That's a normal feeling, but it ever gets to the point where you don't, you don't want to get out of bed or you're too scared to go to school that we're here and we'll deal with it together. So I think, seeing things through my daughter's eyes has been very helpful in this time. You know, they're my number one priority. They are not going to be worse off if we get takeout more often. They are not going to be, you know, worse off if we watch more TV. Uh, they are going to be worse off if we don't listen to each other. And if they see that their parents don't treat themselves with dignity and respect and have time for themselves as well. This answer is just, it resonates so deeply. Uh, Earlier today, I was talking with different uh, students, female students uh, at a school and their parents and, and teachers. And the conversation that we have with ourselves when nobody's watching, when we're not on social media and not out there getting, you know, wanting to be loved and understood for who we are, but only seeing perfect people with perfect families. And that's not the case. Everyone has their own struggles. Um, but there is, when it comes to mental health, a gender gap. You were describing everything that you do and that, you know, to not seek for perfection, to seek for progress. Mm -hmm. Can we address this gender gap when it comes to mental health? Because first of all, it seems like the biggest compliment you can get when you're a woman is you're a superpower. You do it all. Oh, yeah, really? At what cost? And I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up. I think it's so insightful. And I think we use that kind of superhero language with women all the time. We also use it during the pandemic with healthcare providers or teachers or frontline workers. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that superhero language, as you point out, is it means that you're superhuman. It means that you can't take time for your own needs or to care for your own mental health. We know that in the pandemic from some research that has come out through CAMH, through survey data, um, we also know it just experientially talking to each other. Um, and in, in general, you know, women have higher rates of depression and anxiety. And part of that is uh, sort of genetic, biological, you know, the postpartum period, the perinatal period. Some part of it is having higher rates of experiences of trauma um, mm -hmm. and um, whether it's intimate partner violence or sexual trauma. And these are, as we talked about trauma earlier, these are risk factors for mental health conditions. And in the pandemic, you know, nine out of 10 nurses are women, for example. Mm -hmm. You're wearing, as you say, so many hats. Um, Non-white women, women with disabilities are disproportionately affected. Mm -hmm. And we know that if you're in, experiencing intimate partner violence, for example, during the pandemic, it is a lot harder to leave um, a very stressful situation. Um, I think there was a study that came out recently that showed 70% of Canadian women are experiencing higher rates of anxiety um, and distress right now. And I think if you think about your social circle you know, these things that don't get picked up in research, just the conversations you're having, I don't think anyone would be surprised. And I think the other piece around women's mental health lagging behind is that we know for a very long time, women's bodies were considered to be aberrant in a sense. So having hormones or being able to get pregnant meant that you didn't qualify for a research study. So in cardiac studies before, you know, 1993, you only have male participants, but we know that women's and men's bodies are different and our experiences are different. So at ChemH, one of the, the um, interventions that we're so proud of is something called Women Mind, which is focused on investing in women's mental health research and investing in women who do mental health research. Because I think if you can see yourself around a table, if you aren't left behind, if you can succeed in that really challenging period where you're building career and having children, if you can be mentored, um, I think it can go a really long way to highlighting women's issues and making sure that there's a place for women at the table. Incredible. Um, we, we are creating, you know, at a federal level, a lot more opportunities for uh, 
for women to what I don't like to call, uh, you know, male jobs. Um, but you know, in the scientific field and all that, it's it's so important to be able to create opportunities for young female Canadians because the pool of talent is there. It's just that we need to continue to create these opportunities. Um, what would you say to the young girls who, or, or, or young boys who look up to you and who say, you know what, that's what I want to do too. I want to have pe people's feelings, like your, like your, your, your own kids say. It's so beautiful. I love it. Yeah, I, I think sometimes, um, and I, I mentor a lot of amazing young people, people who are going to change the world. And I think sometimes there's this idea that if you want to achieve or you want to do science or if you want to be a physician or work in mental health, that you have to be sure of it all the time and you have to be sure of yourself and you have to be the best at everything. What I would say is that having some insecurity, not being 100% sure, it makes you empathic. It makes you able to connect with people and it makes us have people who may not be traditionally represented in the space. So we know that out people's outcomes improve when physicians are more diverse, when we have Black and Indigenous physicians caring for Black and Indigenous communities, when we have opportunities for research, um, for expansion and for growth. And so I would say to young people that there's two things. One is you can do it and you don't always have to be sure all the time. And it's it's again, it's it's progress, not perfection. And to the second point, it's sort of what you mentioned earlier, Sophia, around investment, how it's really important for us as a society, as a country to invest in young people and to invest in people who are often left behind or often not represented in, um, in different spaces. So they owe us their, you know, their genius and their hard work and we owe them a chance to thrive and succeed. You say, and this is going to stay with me, um, progress, not perfection. I, I often say that what is repressed needs to be expressed in order to progress. And that as an individual and as a society. Um, can we talk about emotional literacy and how if we develop as parents, as mentors, as friends, a more open approach to talking about our feelings and I would say uh, develop our intelligence when it comes to talking about our feelings um, in a culture that still stigmatizes and still shames a little bit in different ways um, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. I was on a, a panel with a, a woman named Nicole Waldron who is uh, brilliant and a, and a mental health advocate, uh, advocate for parents. Um, as well. And she said something that I, I loved. Um, she said, I don't like when people say the devil is in the details. I like to say the love is in the details. And so when you have, you know, children in your life that you love, you know them better than anybody. And if they're maybe, you know, a little bit more irritable, or if they are maybe, you know, sleeping, taking a long time to fall asleep at night, or if they are crying a little bit more, you know, those details are a place where you can approach them and say, you know, I noticed X or Y, I love you, what's going on? And reaching out with love is always the right answer. And the other piece of advice I would give around emotional literacy, I think it it came from one of my chat groups of, of women, of Indian women in medicine. And one of the women uh, who's a child psychiatrist said, strike when the iron is cold. Uh, and I love that so much. And I think sometimes we don't, you know, our teen years our preteen, teen teen years, I'm sure as you know, this is a time where people are having new onset of mental health issues. There's all kinds of stressors, especially right now for young people. And if we can have those conversations earlier and earlier, if we can strike when the iron is cold and, and talk about what feelings are and talk about even what suicidal thinking could be or what addiction looks like or our own struggles or our own recoveries, you know, this can go a long way. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to start those conversations um, early than later. I, I think about, you know, in the Olympics, if you have, if you're teaching someone to do bobsled or luge, it's a lot easier to learn on flat ground and to build up to that, you know, big scary event than it would be to sort of do it all at once and for the very first time when you're struggling. This is so true. And beating the iron when it's cold makes me think of, you know, I would say those awkward problems, awkward conversations that we have, you know, as parents with kids or between ourselves, sometimes the most awkward can you see me I think oh I i'm so sorry i just you just cut out for one second mm -hmm. but no, i think no, there you no. are no problem Perfect. um yeah it's um it's really about sharing our stories and being vulnerable enough to know that there's always going to be allies along the way who 
who will be there for us. For all the people right now who might be listening who can't find security and emotional security in, in your own home, know that there are allies everywhere. Um, you know, CAMH, uh, Wellness Together Canada from the federal government website that can direct you to different services. Shelters uh, are being, you know, are receiving more money because there's so many crises, women in crisis right now throughout the country. Um, what would you say to somebody right now who's really suffering deeply? What is the first step? I think the first thing I would say to someone who's suffering is that you matter and that your life matters. And right now, if you're experiencing depression or anxiety, it's a, they're really cruel illnesses, right? Because they make us think that we are worthless and they make us think that help isn't available. So it's like you're fighting two battles. And I think what I would say is sometimes you need to let other people hold on to that hope for you. So if you're suffering, there is help that exists and there is hope that exists and there are stories of hope and recovery. I really like what she said about how sometimes you may not have that safety in the home. There may not be that person in the home, especially if you have trauma or if you're in a place where people may not have the language to talk about mental health and mental illness. But to know that there are, you know, there are crisis lines, there are doctors, there are, you know, sometimes people in the emergency department will say, you know, it was a teacher who saw me, who saw that I was struggling, who saw that I was in pain. It was a neighbor. And I look at young people and they have these communities, these chosen families, and they support each other. So you know, there, there's, there's someone out there for you. Um, this is these, this is an illness and there are treatments out there that work um, and that are very effective and you are deserving of them. And then again, we as a society now more than ever need to invest in mental health care to make sure that every Canadian, no matter where they live, whether it's Toronto or Timmins or, or St. John's or Victoria has access to high quality mental health care. Absolutely. Um, when somebody suffers and are in their darkest moments, uh, it's always difficult because in that moment you can't see clearly. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Because if you're suffering, when it comes to the darkest point, a lot of people will tell you, I had, you know, I had this light or I had this moment where I kind of woke up or somebody woke me up or what do we tell the, the people who are really in a dark, dark place? And I think dark is such a, a an emotionally compelling word for it. Um, you know, I think we think about mental health care as shining a light in the darkness. And especially I think when people are suffering from suicidal thoughts, although we've come so far in talking about mental illness, that can feel scary and mysterious and shameful. I think the first thing we need to know and to say to people is that one out of every 20 Canadians can experience suicidal thinking, that it is something that happens and the vast majority of people recover and the vast, vast majority of people, not even the vast majority, almost everyone can recover and can live a full and meaningful life. And so in that moment, it might be really hard to hold on to that hope to say, I'm going to live the life I've always dreamed of or a life of meaning. But if we can say, can we get you through? Can we say not today? Can we get you through to the next day? And maybe in that time, we can connect with loved ones who can take care of you, connect with the healthcare resources. Sometimes what we need is time. Sometimes when we're grieving, if we've lost a relationship or lost somebody we've loved or lost out on an opportunity, you know, things will always be there with us. But we know that with time, things can mellow and things can feel a little bit different. So and, how do we get through today, this dark day today? Yes, or or, or the next hours, right? The... Um you made me think of something. <laughs> You're so inspiring, and I'm, I'm writing. I'm, I'm taking notes because you, you make me think of other questions to come up. But um, what about if you had something to change? You know, when it comes to mental health today in 2021 in a country like ours, what would it be? I think it's investment. Um, I think that's. I think before. So how do you know you have a problem if you don't have a name for the problem? And I think over the last 50 years, 20 years, 30 years, we've come so far in naming the problem and raising awareness, which is extraordinary, and decreasing stigma. And then, then we decrease stigma within communities and break down barriers. And then I think the next piece is investment. I think often people talk about with the pandemic, oh, we're going to see a shadow pandemic of mental illness. I don't think that's the case. I think what we're actually seeing is sort of the cracks and fissures of, you know, systems that have been underfunded for decades. And I think if we can invest now, that is going to um, be worth its weight. Investment in research, investment in access, investment in trauma therapy, um, investment in virtual care, investment in, you know, the, the, the social determinants of health that make 
uh, make a life worth living. So making sure people have freedom from oppression and, and housing security and food security. So I think all of the things that um, we are investing in, um, yeah. I think this is a real- uh, Are you reassured by what you're starting to see? Because there have been uh, historical massive investments in, in research and mental health from the federal government and, and provincials as well. And, you know, I've been talking to people from across, you know, the country and uh, everybody's agreeing that there is a urgency um, uh, to respond to, you know, now. Absolutely. And, really and, I, and it's, we're always sort of lagging, but I, you know, I look at the, you know, the Canadian Suicide Prevention Service and the massive investment that is happening there. Um, and I, I work with Alison Crawford, who's the, the chief medical officer, who's so inspiring for that service and the investment in the, you know, creating the Center of Excellence for Mental Health um, that my colleague Paul Kurdiak, um directs, you know, these kinds of investments broadly in mental health and access are unbelievably important. And then I think also targeted investment into making sure that we can care for, um, you know, rural men, we can care for, you know, young black Canadians, and we can care for people um, who are refugees and immigrants. I think both broad investment and targeted investment, and then measuring the return on investment is so important. Uh, two last questions. First, as we address the gender gap and that, yes, from a mental health pers perspective, uh, women and, and their families are more at risk, especially in situations of, uh, of crisis and you know also the definition of, of femininity and what it means to be a woman in, in in our society in 2021 but also can we address the fact that boys are suffering as well uh, in their own definition that they have to live with of masculinity and the culture of i would say uh, you know the macho culture the bro culture which is which is incredibly uh, hurtful to the potential of, of men and boys. Could we address this from a mental health perspective? Yeah, I couldn't agree with this more. And we know that men, middle-aged men, have the highest rate of suicide in Canada. And this is really important to address. And I think that, you know, the culture you described, toxic masculinity, mixed masculinity, often we focus on the impact it has on women, but it has tremendous impact on young men, men who may not see themselves as, you know, meeting those kind of gender requirements, men who may say, oh, it's not manly to talk about my feelings or it's not manly to seek help. Um, young men and boys who may not fit into that kind of typical gender spectrum or, you know, trans boys or non-binary people. You know, this is really, really, really important. And I think, you know, what you talked about, like emotional literacy, prave, like pairing talking about mental illness as a way of being brave and showing hope and recovery is so important. I think about you know, men's stories and how a man, you know, disclosing that he's had suicidal thinking or has seek, has sought help for care um, can be extraordinarily moving um, and very, very important. I couldn't agree more. You know, change, change occurs, real deep change takes place in a society, not because, oh my God, it's time, there's a crisis and it needs to happen. It happens because people get engaged in the process. So whoever is listening now, we want to hear your stories. You are part of changing our culture your own health and how we perceive mental health issues and what i love about you um, is that you said that you like to surround yourself with people who think differently but i think this is huge especially in canada because we're so diverse there's so many different communities and and you know cultures and i think that we have so much to gain from it and learn from it so how do you live that in your daily life what do you mean by it so i am very lucky um to be a part of the largest psychiatry training program um, in, I think, in North America at the University of Toronto, and CAMH is the the Ooh. largest hospital within that institution. We I think we train something like forty percent of all psychiatrists in Canada, and I have been. And so by the way, apparently, it's difficult to become a psychiatrist. Like I, I was talking to a young guy who was applying medical school uh, over lunch, and he said it's really tough to become a psychiatrist. It's it is. It is, and I think. And I think 20 years ago, it was considered to be something that was kind of easy to match to or easy to pair to. But now it's so competitive, which is great. And I see these young people who come in, who have an interest in social justice, who have an interest in anti-racism, who have an interest in understanding the world through different research methods and creative research methods. Um, who I also work a lot with young people who have lived experience of mental health issues. And I don't like the term lived experience. I prefer lived expertise or dual expertise. Mm -hmm. So people who have suffered from mental health issues, who have been through the system and are using those experiences to co-create incredible interventions and to use their expertise to build a system that can serve their needs better. So I think I learn more from the people that I mentor than they could ever learn from me. And I've been so lucky to have wonderful mentorship as well. And it is um, 
well, one of my mentors once said to me, like, seeing people succeed like you is the best part of my job. And I thought he wasn't, I think he, I thought he was just being nice um, because it's a really <laughs> nice thing to say, but um, as don't, I, under, don't underestimate it. <laughs> yeah. And as I see my, like the people who I've mentored succeed and do extraordinary things, uh, there is no better feeling um, in the world. I couldn't agree more uh, as a mom, as a friend, you know, as an ally to anybody who, uh, who, is, who is on the mental health, um, I'd say path, because again, we're all just one trauma away from one another. And uh, doctors are here. Thank you for your devotion, but also thank you for your authenticity, uh, for sharing the truth. Um, I think that truth sharing from the heart and the mind is probably what will save us all. And it, it, it demands also a lot of work, a lot of hope and a lot of positivity. So wherever you are, and if you're listening, you're never alone. Uh, you have allies and doctors are here and, and experts across the country. There is help and um, we'll always be there. Thank you so, so much for joining me today. There will be two more conversations coming up with uh, amazing experts and uh, doctors are here. You're just, you're just so inspiring. And I love that we can say, we don't have to be perfect. We just have to make sure we stay open enough to progress, you know? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Same here. Bye.